So saying about the oppressors, and that's all I've ever had really, for the most part, are oppressors as uh, professors or teachers or students or uh, bosses or parents. And they only know how to tell you what to do, manipulate you, tell you, you control your behavior, uh, but inspiring you and talking to you like your person. That's not been my experiences. Uh, so I was talking about how the slaves love their oppressors, they love their masters. There's a Stockholm Syndrome, a strong case of Stockholm Syndrome, especially here in Kentucky, a union state that pretends like they're south. So they uh, identify with the losers of the Civil War when the winners of the Civil War were right and everlasting right. They were for being for Lincoln and against slavery is right and will always be right. It will never change. That will never change. So um, Frederick Douglass, he talked about how the slaves would fight over uh, who had the better master, who was richer, who was stronger, um, who was kinder and, you know, all sorts of kind of silly things. So it was like bad enough to be a slave, but to be a poor man's slave was a total disgrace. So if you're a poor man's slave, that would just be the worst thing in the world if you're somebody that was, you know, on the upper echelons. But the slaves are talking about their masters as if somehow their greatness was bestowed upon them, as if, like, being Jacob's uh, slaves or being uh, Colonel Lloyd's slaves would be better. Was it better to be Jacob Jepson's slaves or Colonel Lloyd's? Is it better to be the slaves of the Democratic Party or the Republican Party? Is it better to be slaves of Obama or Romney? And people, the slaves, they just love their masters. They just love their massa. Um, and they'll fight and they'll quarrel over it. And Harry Tubman said that more slaves could have been rescued if they would have known that they're slaves. And I think that's the problem that we have right now. You are working class people, America. You're working class people. Okay, you want to pretend like you're rich and you're uh, all um, affluent? You have selective affluence, okay? You might have a nice car, but you got a crappy house. You might have a decent house, uh, but you got a crappy car. You know what I mean? Like, you, you can go out to dinner to a Chinese restaurant every once in a while here and there, but you can't do it all the time. So don't uh, quit thinking that you're the 1%. Quit pretending that you're. Um, you know, Mitt Romney's class. You're not Mitt Romney's class. At least Obama's talking to us. At least Obama's reaching out to the working class people. Uh, Romney's just basically saying, fuck working class peoples. And the unions are on the fence anyway, so the fact that the unions are even, I bet they'll come up. Romney will blast the unions. He'll keep on shitting on the unions. When Obama is, uh, talking about strengthening the unions and getting, um, uh, uh, EPCA, the Employee Free Choice Act, Employee Free Choice Act, so EFCA, E-F-C-A, passed, and the Employee Free Choice Act would help the labor unions. It would help uh, the cause that we're, we're here fighting. So um, one's fighting for labor unions, and that's how you could tell the litmus test of who cares about working class people, who fights for labor unions, who fights against labor unions. And uh, Mitt Romney is totally against labor unions. Have you ever seen Wall Street? Mitt Romney is the guy that buys the airport out and then puts all the union workers out of business. Um, so that's Mitt Romney with Bain Capital. He's a, a, a true blue, through and through capitalist. If it makes money, if it makes him money, fuck all else, fuck everybody else. So that's uh, that's what we're that's what we're faced with right now. Um, so the electoral strategy, I think, uh, having a third party Du Bois, uh, third party strategy is a good idea. Um, I was thinking about the uh, Paulo Freire, how he actually talks about, and this is what I see in class, so like I was talking about education in the very beginning, Paulo Freire talks about horizontal violence. So the slaves will fight amongst each other, but they won't actually attack the oppressors. So like Frederick Douglass was saying, the, the, the Jepson, what was his name, Jepson and... Um, Jepson and uh, Mr. Jepson, Colonel Lloyd and Jacob Jepson. So... Um, that's what we're having to do. We're fighting over our oppressors. No, Colonel Lloyd is the best. No, Jacob Jeff Jepson's the best. I like Jacob. I like Lloyd. I like Jacob. I like Lloyd. So who's better, Jacob or Lloyd? Um, well, they're both oppressors. They're both slave owners. So the both of the slaves of Jacob and of Colonel Lloyd, Jacob Jepson and Colonel Lloyd, need to band together and overthrow their masters. That's what they need to do. Overthrow the masses. Uh, topple the dictator. That that's uh that's democracy. It's also revolution. Look what they did in Egypt. Egypt, oh my god, I think the uh Mubarak in a cage, that's that's wonderful. That's great. That gives the popular image just up there with the French Revolution. The French Revolution was clear cut. 
you know, the aristocracy is gone. They have no heads. They're dead. They've been killed. They've been murdered. So there is no ruling class anymore. Uh, Mubarak was in a cage, and so like, and you know, anything short to having their head beheaded, it's it shows that the Egyptians were humane, uh, but at the same time was instilling justice on a corrupt uh, dictator. And it's amazing how they actually got a hold of. Uh, Mubarak. I'd love to figure out how they got a hold of Mubarak, how they actually get a hold of him, you know, how they actually grab grab him and put him in, in handcuffs. Because a lot of times when you got two powerful people, that's what happens is it comes down to who can put the other handcuffs on the other guy first. So, slaves are fighting amongst each other. In the classroom, you have horizontal violence. I'll say, but teacher, you know, I don't think that's true. And then somebody else will be like, oh, teacher, I think you're so right and wonderful and great. And it's like, man, fuck you. That's not even, a, we're not even having a real fucking conversation now. And it sucks because it's like, since I'm subordinating myself to sit down and shut up, I'm accepting, you know, the, uh, uh, the hierarchy of the classroom. Um, Whereas we should be in a circle, and it should be more like St. John's College, where there's an advisor who gets us to talk to each other. That way we, as students, as peers, will learn to educate each other instead of viewing each other as competitors to fucking shit on. Because that's, that's all I've noticed in, in class and school. Uh, we're all slaves, and instead of actually uh, banding together and uh, going after the oppressor, the professor oppressors, uh, instead, we all are attacking each other, um, and that that doesn't help us at all. That don't help our conditions whatsoever. But there's always going to be your Dwight Schrute, kiss ass, passive, um, you know, boot licker, fucking butt kissing, fucking sycophant, you know, kiss ass suck ups. There's always going to be those people, Uncle Tom's. There's always going to be Uncle Tom's that just kiss the fucking boss's ass. That's that's a role. People need ass kissers, but if you want to be a, a strong, independent individual, you need to be able to make decisions on your own. So, um, Paula Freire from Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Who are better prepared than the oppressed to understand the terrible significance of an oppressive society? Who suffer the effects of oppression more than the oppressed do? Who can better understand the necessity of liberation? Then those who are enslaved, they will not gain this liberation by chance, but through the praxis of their quest for it, through the recognition of the necessity to fight for it. They've got to realize where they are in this historical, sociological society. They've got to figure out where they are, where they stand in uh, society. And this fight, because of the purpose given it by the oppressed, will actually constitute an act of love, opposing the lovelessness which lies at the heart of the oppressor's violence. Lovelessness, even when clothed in false generosity. False generosity is what oppressors use. Here, I'm going to give you some, you know, false generosity so that way you'll stay my slave. But almost always during the initial stage of the struggle, the oppressed, instead of striving for liberation, tend themselves to become the oppressors or sub-oppressors. The very structure of their thought has been conditioned by the contradictions of the concrete existential situation by which they were shaped. Their ideal is to be men, but for them to be men is to be oppressors. This is their model of humanity. This phenomenon derives from the fact that the oppressed at a certain moment of their ex existential, ex existential experience adopt an attitude of adhesion to the oppressor. So the oppressed and the oppressor become one. The oppressor looks at themselves as the oppressor. Stockholm Syndrome, which is what Egypt was almost on, is what Kentucky totally on. You ain't Confederate, Kentucky. You never was Confederate. Most of you all was for the Union and for Lincoln and against slavery and how smart that was. How right for you to be against slavery and for America and against treasonous traitors that just want to hold on to black slavery and white supremacy. Fuck those people. And I bet you those are the original Protestant Puritans that the Germans ran into when we first came to this country. The Protestant Puritans who were burning the witches and who were attacking the Germans and the Irish and the Catholics. Those white people, that same block of white people, those wasps have been showing hatred for every group of people since we've got to this continent. And that group of, I guess they want to say they're purists. Yeah, well, you'd be too pure, you're going to end up like in eastern Kentucky and your skin will turn blue, okay? So, um, I think it's actually more pure to allow biology to unfold for itself. And if black and white want to get together, if brown and blue want to get together, why not?
Why not? That's their choice. It has nothing to do with you. Who gives a fuck? If two consenting adults uh, want to get together, that's their choice. Again, why does that concern you? Who gives a fuck? That's their choice. That's their right. Let them be free in their own house. You have a right to be free in this country. It is not our right to legislate and tell other people what to do. But specifically, I'm criticizing this one consistent band of people, the racists, the Confederates, the people who are attacking the Germans and the Irish, um, the racist Confederates who are attacking the black people, the racist Confederates who were fighting the Indians when they first got here, those racist Puritan, white, Anglo-Saxon, English, European bastards need to fucking stop. They've been white supremacist dickholes for, since 1492, and they need to fucking stop. Seriously, stop being a white supremacist dickhead. It's a multicultural society. We're a nation of immigrants. This ain't your land. You have no say-so. Very little say-so on who should be allowed and who should not be allowed to stay here. You should be happy with the multicultural society that gives you a place and it gives everybody a place. So, the oppressors, um, the uh, uh, sub-oppressors, a lot of times, the, the oppressed, when they get free, they become oppressors themselves. They understand a concrete situation of their slavery. Uh, they understand their slavery before there was one boss and you were the slave and that's just how it was. And everybody went along with that. It was very easy. You could understand it. There was a hierarchy. It was understood. So um, this phenomenon derives from the fact that the oppressed at a certain moment of their existential ex uh, experience adopt the attitude of adhesion. Uh, under these circumstances, they cannot consider him sufficiently clearly to objectify them, to discover him outside themselves, to be able to see him clearly in the context in which they are stuck. I'm, I am uh, oppressed, but not directly. I don't have a lord over me. I will have classes. So I will have professors. So those will be direct oppressors. Um, but um, there's an agreement that I actually agree to. So it's kind of like a job. It's kind of like a wage slavery thing. So while I accept... Uh, some degree of dictation, um, I will, will uh, expect respect and dignity also at the same time. So, um, the and in other ways, I'm oppressed. I'm oppressed economically since I'm not a rich man. Um, I'm working class man, and I don't have a car. Um, so economically, the way I'm oppressed, I have to eat food. So that you know binds me to Kroger or to a restaurant. Uh, so I'm not you know free in that way. I'm not self-sustaining when it comes to food. Um, I, you know, pay for electricity with a different company. So, like, um, another big way is um, my landlord. I pay $600 every month uh, for rent. $600 is what I pay for rent. That's impressive. That means I am having to pay $600. And you would think since all everybody in this household here that I'm living in are paying $600, you would think we all could, like, you know, bound together and unite and say, you know, this is bullshit and we should be able to stand together for our rights. But instead of doing that, there's all this mutual suspicion that's going on and it sucks. It's fucking bullshit. You know, I guess I shouldn't, I don't know, I should quit expecting people to... Uh, be decent human beings and have some sort of ideas of uh, solidarity and unity and, um, you know, community and cooperation. So that's, that's my fault. It's America. I know it's America. We dog eat dog here, so there's no community. It's, you know, you got to watch your back to make sure nobody's trying to fuck you over. So the... Um, uh, so the oppressors, uh, the oppressed look uh, through the world through the oppressor's eyes. So, but this doesn't necessarily mean that the oppressor are unaware that they're downtrodden, but their perception of themselves as oppressed is impaired by their submission in the reality of the oppression. At this level, their perception of themselves as opposites of the oppressor does not yet signify engagement in a struggle to overcome the contradiction. The one pole aspires not to liberation, but to identifi identification with its opposite pole. So the oppressed have this dual identity, which is pulling them in separate direction, separate and opposite direction. In this situation, the oppressed do not see the new man as the person to be born from the resolution of this contradiction as oppression gives way to liberation. For them, the new man or woman, woman themselves become oppressors. Their vision of the new man or woman is individualistic because of their identification with the oppressor. They have no consciousness of themselves as persons or as members of an oppressed class. It is not to become free that they want agrarian reform, but in order to acquire land and thus become landowners, or more precisely, bosses over their workers. That's why they want land reform. Not to 
uh, have self-sustenance and be able to raise their own food, but so they can lord over other people. They want to become managers so they can lord over others. They want to become the teacher or the educator so they can boss other people around. And that's the wrong view of how we should actually be looking at human interaction and human behavior. So, viva la revolucion.